Hey everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Joy Johnson and I am the president of Simon Fraser University. And I want to begin this evening in a good way. And to do so, it's my honor to invite Chief Janice George, a member of the Squamish Nation, to offer a traditional welcome. So please, over to Chief Janice George. Tinoyap in Sequato. I is chop tinoyap. I is chop tinoyap. Japhemia siam kwasham and sna. Tinachin plus knock is go hot wish o homeo on one octan squallowin. I just said on one octan squallowin. I'm here with a respectful heart. And I said peace to each and every one of you. Peace to each and every one of you here. My ancestral name is Japhemia siam. I'm a representative, a speaker of the Squamish people, and I represent my George family. My elders of my family have asked me to step into this role, and I'm, I'm so happy and honored to do so. As well, I'm honored to be here to welcome you tonight. I, um, I think this is just an amazing, amazing um, accomplishment um, for the authors Martha Piper and in and Indira Samariskara. Um, it makes me think of um, the importance of what women do in, in uh, the communities, what women do in the world. And I think back to my ancestors, um, the strong women of the Squamish nation, who I know have carried our people through the hard times. And uh, it, it encourages me every day to think of what I can I can uh, contribute to our people and contribute to our youth and especially the young ladies in our nation. I think of Mary Capilano who um, paddled her boat, paddled her canoe uh, to the to, from North Vancouver to um, this city uh, and. Uh, sold clams, gathered clams and put them in big bags, put them in her canoe and canoed over to the city, to the Vancouver hotel to sell her, to sell her the clams that she had dug and they would pay her in money, but also they would pay her with, um, she would go through um, the food that they were serving or the food that they were preparing to um, serve at the hotel. And she would um, take things and bring them home and feed not only her family, but um, you know, people in the nation who needed help. And that was one of the things that she did, you know, as a leader, she was also um, a weaver, a basket weaver. I think of Swanamia who um, walked with um, her husband, uh, August Jack, uh, Chatsalano. And um, when she, when uh, people thought she was following, she let them know that she was telling him where to go <laughs> as <laughs> women have a <laughs> women have um um well we do that <laughs> and i think of sequalia who um also helped you know she was there during the the fire, great fire of vancouver one of the women who got in her canoe and went over there and helped to save um people from from the fire um the great fire in Vancouver. I just think of these women because um, there are people who inspire me. And, um, you know, I think of how, how do we contribute as women, as, um, as human beings to our people and how important it is to mentor and uh, speak about what we do, write about what we do and um, um, encourage and mentor younger people. And, and we don't even have to we don't even have to be there. We don't even have to know, but just to have the heart mm -hmm. to be a leader of, of people. And um, I, I'm just really honored to be here and, and welcome, welcome them as well. Osiem. Osiem, thank you very much, um, Chief Janice George, uh, to, for reminding us that leadership takes many forms. And uh, so thank you very much um, for that warm, warm welcome. Uh, I, I want to acknowledge that I'm uh, privileged to be speaking to you today um, from the unceded traditional territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, the Squamish, and the Musqueam people. 
Uh, and before we begin the program, I, it's my job to do the housekeeping. Isn't that interesting? We call it housekeeping. It seems somehow appropriate. Uh, so um, we are meeting. I, I want to begin by saying we're meeting here at Harbour Centre. Um, and this is part of the Vancouver SFU campus. And we're also streaming live on Zoom. So this is kind of a hybrid event. It's a bit new for us. So uh, we've got a great audience here. It's so nice to see people in person. But we also have people joining us on Zoom. For those of you who are on Zoom, uh, we do have closed captioning, and there's a CC button at the bottom of your screen. If you need closed captioning, it's available there for you. You can click that button and then see View Subtitle, uh, and that can um, help you see the closed captioning. I just want to thank AI Media for helping us with the closed captioning. Um, really very much appreciated. So for those of you in person, um, you also can access closed captioning on your mobile device if you need it. There was a QR code. We're really interested in trying to increase our accessibility. So there was a QR code handed out to you, uh, and you can use that uh, as a link if you need uh, closed captioning. Um, and if you need any help with that, anytime during the night, there's going to be a little bit of technical work happening. You can raise your hand, and we've got volunteers who can assist you. And so for our Q&A tonight, we're going to be using, again, some technology called Slido. How many of you have used Slido in the room today? Yes, excellent. We've got a lot of experts. It's a site that you can access on your, on your iPhones. Uh, you don't need an app. You don't need any of that. All you need to do is you need to go to Slido. Um, and so you can see it's sli.do on your web browser. Just put that in. You could do that right now, all of you. Um, and then you enter a six-digit code, 151021. And, uh, You'll see the program come up, and um, eventually we'll be taking questions from the audience. And you can do two things. You can pose your question, but then you can also give a thumbs up to questions you really want answered. And Martha and Dara have told me they really want hard questions tonight, so feel free. <laughs> Um, I do want to remind you, though, that we, and this is important, just to always remind people we have community guidelines about how we engage with one another, and that's about respectful dialogue, about working together uh, to make sure we have a safe, honest, and um, uh, socially accountable um, conversation. So uh, that's part of my job as well um, as the uh, host for this evening. So um, I am absolutely thrilled. This is all about this book, Nerve, but it's also about on. Oh. oh, sorry, you need the number again. So can we go back? We, we've got some people who are a little slow with their technology in the room tonight. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's 151021. Okay, everyone got that? And if you don't have it and need help, you can put your hand up. Okay, excellent. So it's all about the book, and there are, I'm going to say, I'm going to keep flogging this, there are books for sales at the back of the room, and for those of you online, you can order your books. Um, but this is also about celebrating the le leadership of two really amazing women. Um, we're really pleased um, as um, Canada's engaged university to have an opportunity to have a discussion about women in leadership with these two incredible individuals. Um, we're looking forward to sharing your stories and hearing about your experiences as, as women who have taken on first presidencies at two of really important universities in Canada, uh, UBC and University of Alberta. And I think we can all recognize that while we're seeing women representation in higher education in increasing, there's still work to be done. And there's work to be done across sectors. It's, uh, you know, I think that often we think, uh, you know, the gender gap has been narrowed, but that's not the case. There still is a lot of room to go in terms of promoting women in leadership. So Martha and Indira really have paved the way. When I was considering becoming a president, uh, two of the first calls I made were to these two individuals who really picked up the phone, so thank you very much, and provided me with excellent advice. And I think tonight you're going to also hear from them um, the incredible advice that they have. This book, Nerve, um, uh, Lessons on Leadership from Two Women Who Went First, it is terrific. And it really takes you through the leadership journey. And what I like about the book is it tells stories 
but it also gives um, just a number of um, really important um, lessons um, from leadership as well. So it's got that kind of combination of personal stories plus lessons. So um, hopefully tonight we'll have a conversation, but we'll also hear a little bit about the book as well and hear some quotes from the book. So with no further ado, it's now my great pleasure to invite, first of all, I'm going to introduce them and invite them to come to the stage. Uh, first of all, Dr. Indira Samaraskara. Uh, and Indira served as the first woman president of the University of Alberta. Um, she's a uh, director for Magna International, TC Energy, and Stelco. She served as a director of the Bank of Nova Scotia. She's an officer of the Order of Canada. She was born in Colombo, Sri Lanka, and lives here in Vancouver. I could go on and on. Please welcome Indira Samaraskara. And obviously our second guest this evening is Dr. Martha Piper. She served as the first woman president of the University of British Columbia. And then she went back and did it again. Well, that's a whole other story. And uh, she's been a director also of the Bank of Montreal, Shoppers Drug Mart Board, um, and Transalter Corporation. She's also an officer of the Order of Canada. She was born in Lorraine, Ohio. She lives with her husband, William Piper, here in Vancouver, British Columbia. Please join me in welcoming Martha Piper. <clears throat> My word, we're already getting questions on Slido. That's incredible. And I'm going to come to those eventually. Um, but um, we're going to have a bit of a conversation. And so I get to ask the first question. Uh, so um, I think, you know, the first question I would uh, have is, is about the title of the book. Why nerve? You know, I, I can imagine you went through a few different iterations of titles. But why nerve? And maybe also an example of when you've had to use nerve as well. So, well, I well, first of all, thank you, Joy, for hosting us and for having us here. And most of all, thank you for coming, those of you who are here physically and those of you who are here virtually. We really appreciate your supporting uh, this event. You know, we're asked that question all the time. And I have to tell you that those people who know me a little bit know that I'm absolutely wacko about Georgia O'Keeffe. Now, Georgia O'Keeffe was an artist, a woman artist, who painted at a time where very few women were painting. And she chose to paint things that nobody was painting. She painted during the early Impressionist years when everyone was going to Europe to paint. And she said, no, I'm not going to go to Europe. I'm going to go to New Mexico. And I'm going to paint skulls. And I'm going to paint flowers and I'm gonna paint these very odd landscapes. I was intrigued with this woman. I've read everything you can possibly read about her. She wasn't particularly nice, but she had nerve. And there's a quote that I have over my desk that she said, which is this, it takes more than talent. It takes a kind of nerve, a kind of nerve and a lot of hard, hard work. I love that quote because it tells me that as a woman, you don't have to be particularly talented. And we know how to work hard. We know that in spades. But what we often lack is nerve. Nerve to do things a little differently. Nerve to make a tough decision. Nerve to take a stand. Nerve to sit up and be noticed. And consequently, Indira and I began to think, you know, Georgia had it right. And we wanted to, I guess, bring attention to the fact that in our experience, that's been something that's been hard for us to conjure. And we've also noted that many women are a little concerned about being nervy. You know, she's got the nerve, the nerve of her. So here's just a little something about how we put it into our book. Throughout this conversation, we conclude that for women, there is a recurring thread connecting our three phases of leadership, developing your nerve to lead, which is the first section of the book, drawing upon your nerve when leading, second section of the book, and finding the nerve to reinvent yourself when you are no longer leading. Nerve is the personal attribute that we believe 
is not only required to lead, but also is often missing in women, even in those who aspire to leadership roles. Nerve to be true to yourself, nerve to take a path less traveled, nerve to go first, nerve to act decisively, nerve to redefine yourself. Women are good at most things. We know how to work hard. We often over-prepare for whatever task we are performing. We are proficient at collaboration, consultation, and compromise. All extremely important traits for a leader. But if there is one characteristic that we must actively work on developing and consciously draw upon as we chart our course as leaders, it is nerve. Not easy, not obvious, not immediately part of our repertoire. Over to Indira to tell us how nervy she was. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joy, first of all, delighted to be here. Uh, there are, you said that there are two leaders on the stage who went first. Here you are. You've gone first and you are, you are paving the way and a new frontier. So my story will resonate with you. Universities are incredibly difficult to lead. Even when you have what seems like an obvious opportunity. So my story was Peter Lougheed, some of you will know, famous premier of Alberta, passed away and the government of Alberta and his family wanted to do something to honor the man. And he's a graduate of University of Alberta. So having had conversations, we decided to create a leadership college. Wow, doesn't that Fantastic. sound fabulous? <laughs> well, everybody opposed it. The students didn't want it because they said it was elitist because it was initially going to be a small program. The academics didn't want it because it wasn't an academic <laughs> subject. How dare you teach leadership? What is leadership? Even after I had Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Kim Campbell agree to be the principal of the college, it only made it worse. Well, what does she know? She's a politician. And on and on it went. And I knew that if this proposal was taken to our Senate, it was going to be turned down. And can you imagine the embarrassment, right? And you know, the loudest voices are the ones who come and protest. So I decided, no, I wasn't going to take it to GFC. I didn't need their approval. <laughs> I was going to do this by another means. And so we created an administrative unit called the Peter Lougheed Leadership Initiative. And we got it done. And that took some nerve. Yeah, absolutely. And I, absolutely. I have to tell you. I was not liked, even when I left. I think there were people who were very resentful because they felt that that $75 million should have been distributed to all the faculties like little fairy dust yeah. for them to do whatever they wished with it. So there you go, Joy. No, well, that's, those are fantastic examples. <laughs> and I have to admit, you know, even just since I, I learned about the book, it's just nice to once in a while say to yourself, nerve nerve you, you know like it's yes. good right yes. just to, to and hold on to that it's interesting i'm going to pick up on something you just said and that's this likability factor and we've talked about this right and i think as women leaders and this is something i've struggled with is that you know you work really hard and you think you're going to do it all right and then people will like you and actually they don't always. <laughs> um, and i'm just wondering if you want to comment on yeah. that yeah you know um everybody wants to be liked that's that's part of being human the problem is when you need to be liked. Okay, there's a difference. And I think what happens to many women, and I put myself right there. When I first became president of UBC, I followed a very strong, very, very historic president who probably took UBC farther in a short period of time than anyone. But he wasn't known for being particularly consultative or working with you know groups yeah, no. and consequently in fact i heard from this colleague who had worked <laughs> with him, he wasn't liked but he did a really of all the presidents you know of that generation i can tell you ubc owes him a huge debt of gratitude he took ubc from being a, a very good university to being one of the finest universities in the world in a 12 year period. So, but I come in, you know, I'm supposed to be consultative. 
I'm going to listen to everyone. I'm going to be good. I'm going to compromise. I'm going to be, you know, compassionate and thoughtful. And how long does that last? Not very long. And once you have to make a tough decision and conjure up your nerve, you find that people, some people, don't like you. And what's your, what's the default? The default is you think you've done something wrong. You think you have not done it well. And you take it personally. And I love this line from The Godfather. It isn't personal, it's business. <laughs> And that's what I think women, yeah. and again, we, we don't want to generalize, but what we found, and I found, I had a very difficult time not being liked. But I had to get over it by recognizing it wasn't about me. It was about a decision. And I had to do what was best in my mind for the organization and put up with some of the people who supposedly didn't like me. But it's not easy. And I think women fall into the trap of equating not being liked with not doing well. And mm -hmm. in fact, that's I don't, it I, it, that's, we shouldn't do that. Yeah, I see heads nodding. I think that <laughs> it's very easy to fall into yeah. that, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. And I know you address that in the book. I love that part about, you know, uh, needing to be like, but, you know, versus, you know, wanting to be like, there's a, there's a very, very big difference. Yeah. So we do um, um, have some younger people in the audience tonight as well. And I, one of the things, and you do this in the book, because you kind of go through the leadership trajectory, which I really appreciated, um, is this idea of, um, about how do you, how you prepare yourself to lead. And um, there's a lot of really, I think, interesting advice. And I, I, so I'd, I'd love to kind of jump into that, and maybe, Indira, you've got an example that you'd like to yeah. share, or you know, if so, you want to read as well, whatever you'd like to do. No, so I'll, I'll share the example, because it's an interesting one. Um, I became Vice President of Research at UBC with almost zero administrative experience. There was a president called Martha Piper, who <laughs> decided to take a chance on me. Nerve. <laughs> <laughs> no. Foolhardy, but nonetheless. There is nothing better than being prepared by watching a leader who is outstanding. Mm -hmm. So my first day on the job, I've gone from professor to vice president. I'm feeling pretty chuffed. I walk into my office, and there's an envelope, president's office. Can you imagine? I'm thinking, oh, You've got instructions, <laughs> instructions about what I'm supposed to do. I open the envelope. And in it is a magic wand, a <laughs> wand from Harry Potter. And it's got a little note in it with her beautiful handwriting saying, welcome to the team, let's make magic. Mm. Now, when you encounter a leader like that, the first thing you realize is that you don't have to follow someone else's mold. You can be completely original. Yeah. But then it gets tough. She was a tough leader. When I went into meetings with her, she'd have all her points, right? One, two, three, four, five. If you did not come prepared, she would very politely chew you out. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> or when we were meeting as a team, and I took these, these lessons to Alberta. When we were meeting as a team, that is the vice presidents, and there was an agenda that had been prepared, and there was an agenda that you had asked to be put on the on the on the on the roster and she would say why is this agenda here what action do you want us to take and if you didn't have a good answer for that you never brought another item to the agenda that didn't warrant the discussion of the senior team so the thing that i learned from martha also she never held your hand she had high expectations absolutely believed in excellence i mean for her UBC had to aspire to the highest standards of excellence. I tell the story because uh, if, you, if I had not worked with her for those four years, I would have been unprepared to take on the presidency. So to all young women out there, if you have an opportunity to work with an outstanding leader, make notes, pay attention, listen carefully, 
and you will learn every lesson you need to go. You, uh, that's, that's fantastic. But how about you, Martha? What was your... Well, you know, I'm going to take a little different tack to it because I have to honestly say throughout my entire life, I never prepared to leave. You know, I didn't take courses. I didn't, you know, I didn't even think about it. I was always kind of caught off guard and felt that I had been thrown into it and that, you know, did they really want me? Or why were they asking me to do this? Um, you know, people say to me, well, what did you do to learn to lead? I said, you know, my, my family was very important to me. I'm talking about my father and my mother and my brothers and my sister. Very, very important. And as I look back, my father, and we talk about this in the book, was very key to uh, setting the standards and demanding that we perform as children. So I say to people, he never, I never sense from him that he thought I would lead or that I should lead or that I should be doing stuff to learn to lead. But what he did was he was absolutely determined that I would excel at whatever I did, that I did the best that I could do. He knew that I could do it and he insisted that I do the best. And I think that that would be my recommendation. Do the best that you can do at whatever you're doing and you will then lead well. You know, a lot's written about mentors. And I know many of you probably have mentors. And we think mentors are great. But one of the things we discovered when we wrote this book, and you know, I knew Indira as a colleague. The most wonderful part of this book, writing this book, is now I know her as a person. How fabulous. <laughs> But one of the things we discovered when we looked at our own preparation for leadership was that sponsors were critical. Now, what's the difference? Mentors are people who you listen to, who you mm -hmm. seek advice, who you engage. You know, you're my mentor. Help me. Tell me what I'm doing wrong. I consult with you, okay? A sponsor is someone you don't even know exists. They're in the background. They know of you and they recommend you for something. They tell somebody else how great you are. They go out and nominate you for a position. You don't know. You don't know they're working. And I have mm -hmm. to tell you this story because Indira's already told you. Indira applies for VP research. She's absolutely right. If I had just looked at her CV, it would have gone in the trash. She had no administrative experience. But here's the true story, and she didn't know it until we wrote the book. When I was appointed president of UBC, before I moved from Edmonton to Vancouver, I was still at the U of A, and a wonderful scholar from UBC, a renowned scholar from UBC, came to give a lecture at U of A. And I went to hear him. After the, after the lecture, I go up to him, I introduce myself, I say, oh, I'm so happy to, you're coming to UBC. He had no time for me. He said, well, I'm just going to give you some advice. There's this woman, Indira Samarasekra. You need to keep your eye on her. She's a leader. Three years go by. I never meet Indira, ever. I wouldn't have known her if she walked into the room. I get her application, those words ring true. I think, Indira, that name, Indira Samarasek, oh, that's the woman he told me. He has since died, but was such a renowned scholar and was so respected, so highly regarded, that I say I need to take a second look. And I interview her, and of course, then she flies. She sells herself. He didn't sell her. She sold herself. What he sponsored, his sponsorship of her, though, allowed me to take a second look. Fantastic. Fantastic. And that is a true story. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think it also points out for, for those of us in leadership positions the importance of paying it forward and sponsoring people that we're seeing coming up through the ranks as well. Right? And I think as women, we have even a bigger job because right. men, and again, general aside, but men do it very quick. Yeah. He was a male. Yeah. He was doing it. And on, when we look back, many of, the, many of my opportunities came because men had stepped up right. and told somebody about me. But we now need to do that for each other. 
No, I think that's such great advice. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I find myself reflecting on women in leadership right now. And, um, I, you know, there are a few women, particularly politicians, I would say, have had a pretty rough go of it. And I, I can understand why women don't want to go into leadership roles, right? Um, they're attacked in the media. Um, you know, I, I, I still think there are kind of, there is a bit of a double standard at play. And I, 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 I you know, you, you find yourself wondering why would someone want to be a leader? Why would a woman want to move into, into leadership? And so what advice would you give? I have to read this story. Yeah, that's a good story. You've got to read it. See, you know it, each other's minds. Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> because we are all, we're so similar in so many ways, okay? And so we were like, I was a reluctant leader, and for a lot of the reasons, fear of failure, you think you have to be perfect, you're never perfect, you, you worry, so, you know, you say, why should I do it? So here's the thing. I had been asked to put my hat in the ring for UBC. I didn't know what to do. Me? No. I can't lead. So here's the story. My husband was little help. He said whatever I wanted to do was fine. <laughs> <laughs> the invitation was highly confidential, so I thought it was inappropriate to discuss it with either my friends or colleagues. I gradually realized I was on my own. Enter my unexpected mentor, Don Mazankowski. Do you know uh, who Don Mazankowski is? My gosh, you're all so young. <laughs> a member of parliament for 25 years who served as a cabinet minister under two prime ministers and as a deputy prime minister under Brian Mulroney, a truly Canadian treasure out of Alberta. I had gotten to know Don in his role as a member of the Board of Governors at the University of Alberta, and I was in awe of his intellect, judgment, and overall wisdom. I had watched him deal with controversial issues, financial concerns, community engagement, university affairs, and I had admired and respected his capacity to identify the core issues. One night, as we were both leaving a university reception, Don offered to walk me to my car, as it was, as it always is, extremely cold, <laughs> dark, and late. As we made our way to the parking lot, I decided to confide in Don to seek his opinion on what I should do about my conundrum. I'm not certain why I let my guard down, but I did. I trusted him, and more important, respected him, and genuinely wanted to hear what he would recommend. Now, here's the part. He listened carefully to my dilemma and then quietly said something like this, quote, with most opportunities that come your way, you can find reasons to delay, thinking that the timing is not exactly right or you're not prepared or your kids are too young or you're happy doing what you're currently doing. But if you are lucky, maybe once or possibly twice in your life, an opportunity will come along that will never come again. If you want to be president of UBC, not president of any university, but president of UBC, the time is now. This opportunity will not come again. As the next time the UBC presidency becomes available, you will neither be the right age nor the favored candidate. His words hit me like a ton of bricks. He was mentoring me on one of the most important decisions I would ever make. And I can tell you, I would never have applied yeah. for this position. I would never have stopped up. I was too, afri I was too afraid. Yeah. I was too scared. Yeah. For all the reasons you suggest, because you know it's not easy. But his word said to me, if you want to do this, you've got to dig deep and have the nerve to do it, because it's never coming again. It's interesting, because I think women often, well, men do this too, you know, make excuses, you know, mm -hmm. find the reason to not do it instead of the reasons to do it. So that's a, a fantastic story. Because you're right, these opportunities don't necessarily come again. Fantastic. Um, Maybe uh, I'll ask one more question, then I'll go to Slido here a little bit. Um, and we talked about this before as well. Um, wh and this is this is this is the question I need advice on. So, and it's dealing with crises. Um, you know, this is the, this is my biggest worry as a president is that things are going to blow up. And um, they it, will. Yeah. <laughs> and they have on occasion. We've had little you know hiccups along the road, but 
you know, stuff happens, and um, I, I'm really interested in both from both of you. Particularly, it's in those moments you're really on your own. You yeah. feel on yeah. your own a lot. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, what, you know, what advice you have in terms of just navigating crises um, as women. Me first. Sure. So I think it it, it you feel it alone. Uh, there's a great uh, quote in the book about uh, Teddy Roosevelt. It's a great quote about in the arena, and when you're, you're alone in the arena, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know whether I can find it easily, but nonetheless, the quote really outlines the fact that, you know, when you are in the arena, you're being, you're being battered from all sides. Yeah. But, and you're being battered by people who are not in the arena. They are outside. They've never been in your position. They're giving you advice. And in that moment, you have to look deep and ask yourself what your principles are. Mm -hmm. So I'll talk about my experience very quickly. Honorary degrees, right? Should be, Should be straightforward, right? Honoring people as committees and they select someone. This particular case, we were honoring uh, a C former CEO of Nestle, a big food company. He had done some outstanding work on water on, on, uh, at the World Economic Forum after he retired on uh, water preservation and all of that stuff. Well, the moment his degree was announced, huge number of academics decided that Nestle was a bad company. They had uh, dissuaded women from breastfeeding, not when he was CEO, mind you, you know, 30 <laughs> years ago, uh, and on and on and on. And I was being, and then the news media just loved it. You know, you were the journalists were calling. And the chancellor got very nervous and she was saying, oh, maybe we should rethink. The board was getting all uh, concerned because they were getting calls from people about this. And even my team was getting very nervous about, should I reconsider this? Now, it wasn't my decision to reconsider. I could have taken it back to the committee. But I decided on principle. His file had been looked at. He had done many, many things that were worthy of the honorary degree and I was going to go ahead. And then it took no at convocation, guess, get this part. So we are, <laughs> he's, he's over here, and the chancellor's over there. A bunch of academics were in the audience where you're sitting. Stand up, turn around, and say, shame, shame, oh. shame. And we were, we were prepared. But you know, it just took the air out of me. And poor Peter, he was as gracious as ever, right? The chancellor, to her credit, there's a woman with nerve, stood up and said, this is a very important ceremony. Please be respectful. And then they, I think campus security took them out of the room. So what did I learn? I learned that during a crisis, you really are on your own. You may look at how other people have dealt with it, but you have to ask yourself, what is the principle that you are honoring? And others may not agree with your approach to honoring the principle, but do you believe in it? And are you willing to go the entire distance? With that? So, Martha, over to you. I couldn't agree with you more. And that's where you dig deep, you know, because everyone is pulling you one way or the other. And if you don't, as someone used to say to me, know your true north and that don't know what your principles are, you're in trouble. But here's the other piece of advice I would say, which I was terrible at. So, you know, I wish somebody had told me, maybe I would have listened. But I tend to be an optimist. So I don't like bad news, so when I hear it, I just want to ignore it, right? And uh, we have a section here called Detecting Ripples, Riding Waves. waves. I think leaders get into trouble when they lose control of it, mm. when somehow it gets away from them because they've either ignored it or they haven't dealt with it or it's been too difficult or they haven't had the nerve to actually confront it. The sooner you confront it, the sooner you acknowledge what, what the problem is and get ahead of it, the better off you are. Um, you, and my example, of course, was uh, when we had, right after 9-11, and we had a faculty member who spoke out quite aggressively against the United States. And you can imagine, my email crashed, uh, had death threats, uh, 
all sorts of recommend, uh, people calling me, donors, donors, alumni, government, get rid of this w person who wasn't a tenured professor. Now, what was my problem? My problem was I thought everybody would understand that this was a simple example of academic freedom. I thought everybody, I didn't see it as a problem. <laughs> uh, my, my government affairs people, my legal people are there at 7.30 in the morning. I knew that wasn't a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> they tell me we've got a problem. I say, what, tell me again what the problem is. <laughs> They tell me, oh, this academic has been outrageous. She's said some terrible things, and you know, people are very upset. I said, well, what's the problem? She's an academic. I said, let's get this speech. Be sure it's not hate. If it's not hate, hey, we don't have a problem. Everybody understands she has the right to say what she has to say. My problem was I didn't see the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and I let it go far too out there before, and then when I finally defended her right to speak, it was too late. And people didn't want to hear that. So sometimes even when you are principled, and you're there yeah. with the principal, yeah, that's true. people still don't want to hear it. And you have to have the nerve to believe in your principles. Because today, I can tell you, if you read her speech today, you would not find it dis dis Dis, dis, uh, difficult. It was just the timing and the insensitivity of it and the raw nerves of so many people. Interesting. Yeah. That's a, that's a great story. It's a really great story. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to the, some of the questions on Slido and um, here's the first one. Uh, this is advice. This, is, this one amuses me, so I'm, gonna, I'm going the, the ones that have been voted up, you know. So here's the first one. Advice for women in leadership roles who have to work with men who seem unable to do their work. <laughs> but this is unnoticed by their supervisors, specifically when you are asked by leadership to fix their mistakes or do their work. I don't know if that's happened to you or what advice you would give for women who feel like they have to feel, fix these things. Well, I, you know, I'm trying to recall an, uh, an incident or a story, but I, you know, I think, first of all, you don't take on what's not your problem, right? If this person is not under your, why are you being lumbered with something, you know? Yeah. And, and guys don't want to deal with the consequences. Uh, so it depends on very much what your position is, right? Whether you, if it's a colleague uh, and someone you want to help, you might, you might advise him, mentor him. But as far as I'm concerned, it's not in your purview. What would you do, Martha? Well, I think, I think there's always a risk, and I, I'll put myself there as a woman. Um, when people report to you and they aren't performing, right, whether it's a, a male or yeah. a woman, yeah. it's difficult. Yeah. Uh, because you usually have a collegial relationship. You usually, they're very nice people. Yeah. Uh, you have a, you know, you respect them. But you are their supervisor, mm -hmm. and you do need to mm -hmm. provide them with the feedback. And that's, that is very difficult. Mm -hmm. But what is the default? when we don't have the nerve to yeah. sit down and be honest with yeah. someone and right. tell them they're not yeah. performing as right. they should be. Right. Our default is just to do it ourselves, yes. to take it over. So you haven't organized this, well, oh, you know, I'll do it off of the side of my desk. I'll do it because I can't stand that the event isn't going to be running, running properly. That's the wrong thing to yeah. do. Yeah. And I think as women, we tend to just think we can fix it by just doing it ourselves. Yes instead of actually having the nerve to sit down and be as fair and as clear about what the performance requirements are. Yeah. I think for me the other thing um, is on that side is to also think sometimes we, we report to people that aren't doing their job. Yeah. And um, I think there's also, this is when you really need nerve. Yes. <laughs> To yeah. coach up, right, and, and yeah. to and to also kind right. of speak truth to the power a yes. little bit and talk about what you need from your leader as yes. well, right? Yeah, that's a much harder situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. much more difficult. Great. Uh, this is very uh, kind of a nice follow-on. The question uh, comes from my colleague Diane Feingood. I see uh, nerve to speak uh, truth uh, can be confused by others as pushy. Huh. 
or inappropriate. How can women manage these perceptions, especially when they come from your boss or your board? Well, this is what we talk about, grit and grace, right? Grit and grace, yes. yes. You know, it's about having the grit to be able to identify the issue without it making, making it personal, right? But then having the grace with which to deal with that individual. And I think it's that combination that really, that fine balance that helps you avoid being seen to be pushy. Um, now, I think women are unfortunately often labeled as pushy. And so you have to do a little bit more of the grace than the overt grit, perhaps. But I think it's really an important attribute that actually you can, you, it can be, you can learn it, right? You can learn how to deal with uh, people and have those difficult conversations without being seen to be um, unreasonable, uh, demeaning, disrespectful, uh, difficult. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's an art. And I think it's really good leaders, great leaders, really figure out how to do that. Yeah, it's, a, it's being fair, right. right? And then it's a bit of a style of how you express yourself. And I mean, if someone's always going to see a woman leader as pushy, there's probably nothing you can do to, to change that impression. But I do think that women are better at trying to listen, trying to put themselves in the shoes of the other person, and then trying to be as fair as they can be and then expressing it as, as genuinely and as authentically and as considerately as you can without being, you know, a brusque or, or yeah. abrupt or, or, or demeaning or, you know, all of those things. And that's, you know, the grit and grace, that's not, a, that's not an original term of ours. It's been well used uh, by a variety of people and many people think it's the kind of the silver glove that, that women have, is that they have that appreciation of the other person. And they have a way of communicating that often brings people along and, and it appears to be and is genuinely. I think it has to be genuine. You have to be authentic. You can't just pretend. But I think it's one of our strengths, actually. I think that's such great advice. I think that sometimes people think a leader needs to act a certain way, and that's, I think, when they sometimes get into trouble instead of really just being who they are, yeah. right? Right. right? Do you know, I have, um, when I was named president, a good friend of mine, I was scared to death. I was in Edmonton, scared to death, because, you know, it's one thing to be named, now you got to do it, <laughs> you know? And I was expressing to her how frightened I was. And she looked at me and she said, just be Martha. And she get, made this calligraphy little thing that says, just be Martha. And I put it over my desk. Jane may have seen it. Others may have seen it in my office. And to me, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be presidential. You don't have to be, you don't have to try to be like somebody else. Just be yourself. Yeah. That's, I think that's great advice. Yeah. Good. You still have that? I sure do. <laughs> That's what, right next to my Georgia O'Keeffe thing. That a friend of mine cross-stitched me. Those are my two North Stars. That's fantastic. <laughs> so this is a, an interesting question, and it's about, um, the question is whether you've experienced trauma, um, like through a number of microaggressions or a number of incidents. Like, has it ever added up, I guess, for you? Um, and, and, then, and how did you move through it? Like, things that really just got you. Like, have you ever just felt like totally down with it all, or? Oh, sure. <laughs> Probably the hardest thing, I don't know the hardest thing, one of the things that was very difficult for me was we took a labor strike. First time that UBC had taken a work stoppage. And it was, you know, it was difficult. But I knew it was the right thing. But um, I get off a plane, Coming back from, we're in the middle of it. It's nasty. I get off a plane coming from Toronto and the RCMP is there. And uh, they tell me uh, there's been death threats. And it wasn't, it was on me, of course, but it was on my kids. Yeah. 
So that was, that was tough. Yeah. Really tough. Really, really tough. Wow. And how did you get through it? Well, my kids said, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> we're fine, Mom. We're fine. Oh, you know, you get through it because um, I have, you know, my, my husband, my family supported me. We moved out. We actually they moved us into a hotel and had an unmarked car and all of that. But, uh, and they, they found, the, it was an email that had come in and they traced it immediately and they knew who it was and, you know. Um, but, you know, you're alone. Yeah. You are alone. And I think in those situations, you need support structures that go outside of the institution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can't depend on your, uh, even your associates to support you. You need, you need to, whether it's your family or very good friends or colleagues or people who just believe in you regardless of whether you're right or wrong. My kids didn't know whether I was right or wrong. They knew nothing about the strike. You know, they didn't want to know about any of that. They just, you know, mom, don't worry. We're fine. We're great. You know, um, and that's that's what you, that's you know, you you build those uh, those uh, structures. Wouldn't right. you agree, yeah. Indira? Oh, absolutely. You have to find support from elsewhere. Good advice. Absolutely. Wow. Gives me a chill. Yeah. I have to say. Um, another question. Um, this is about whether you feel ever feel confined to, to narrow stereotypes and the ways you can lead as a powerful woman. Do you ever feel like there have been limitations because of, because of that? And, and dear, there's another question here. As a woman of color, have you felt that that has also <coughs> played a part? You know, I have to say that as a woman and a woman of color, I feel liberated from following any stereotype. I mean, think about the wand, right? There are no stereotypes. You make your own, yeah. you know. I think men have a lot tougher time because they have to sort of follow, if you will, the long tradition of what a president looks like or, you know, how they behave or a leader behaves. I think women of color, women in general, should simply choose their own path and, and take it as an opportunity to, to create a new mold of leadership. I, I you know, maybe because I... You know, I was in, uh, in engineering, right? I was the only female yes. in engineering for how long? I don't know. Um, there were a few of us. And in fact, I got to tell this story because it is an example of when you're an only woman, what you can get away with. So the first female engineer appointed at UBC was not me. I was number two. Number one was this wonderful woman. She's uh, just recently retired, Professor Rabab Ward in electrical engineering. She was from Lebanon, Middle East. Now, can you imagine? Middle East engineer. What did she do for a hobby? Belly dance. <laughs> <laughs> and she would tell all the male colleagues in electrical engineering <laughs> that if they wanted to come and see her belly dance on the weekend, she would be at this place. <laughs> Doing her own thing, right? Okay. You know, I, I, uh, I think that's the liberation, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's great. That's great. Yeah. How about you, Martha? Any? Do you well, I, I, tend to, I tend to agree with Indira, though. You know, I, I never felt that I was restricted by a stereotype. But I think what's difficult, and I tell the story in the book about my installation, when you do step out and do something that yes. is so different, people aren't prepared for it. <laughs> they don't know what to make of it. You know, I did this crazy thing with baseball caps when I was installed. I thought it was the greatest thing since I still bread. have one. There you go. <laughs> really? Yeah, I do. Yeah. What happened? But the reaction in turn in the community in the internal community, community. was devastating. It was, yeah. oh yes, it was uh, seen as, you know, maybe too, well, she's just a cheerleader, it's not academic enough, it's not, you know, she didn't take the installation seriously, who we hired, this crazy woman, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I was stepping out of the stereotype of what presidents had done for years, and I mean, this is a centuries and centuries and centuries old tradition, 
and I take my mortarboard off and put on a baseball cap. Well, you know, that did not sit very well. So I think, and yet, you know, I didn't, I didn't even give it a second thought. It was funny, when I met with the protocol officer and told him that's what I wanted to do, he looked at me and he said, are you sure? <laughs> Now, I, I'm slow at picking up the cues. I said, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. That's what I want to do. And he was such a good foot soldier. OK, OK. But I think that's, the, that's, the, that's really the issue. Yeah, yeah exactly. I'm going to try and sneak in two more. And I'm, I'm going to, this one has been voted up. And I don't even understand it, Martha, but it is over to you. For those of us who are UBC alum from years ago, was Bort real? <laughs> Or yeah. a very smart strategy to feel relatable and build relationships. Bort with was real. Okay, Bort was real, everybody. So this tell is, us who's this Bort. This is very, very simple. Uh, when I was uh, at UBC, they had a day for first year students called Imagine. And it was to get, you know, school spirit. And we brought them all into the, um, you know, the auditorium, the yeah, War Memorial auditorium. Gym, and, you know, screaming and shouting and everything. And then we would march in with our robes on, and I had to give a speech. Now, you know, and I gave this speech about imagination, how important imagination was. And I told in the speech that when I was a child, I had an imaginary friend, and his name was Bort. And it's true. And I lived in this town that had a, a bridge that you had to cross over to get from the residential area to the downtown over a small river. And there was a little house where the bridge, the bridge opened and closed, and there was a little house where the bridge man used to sit. And Bort lived in that house. <laughs> and as we would go across the bridge, my dad would slow down and kind of, OK, let Bort in. <laughs> <laughs> Bort would get in the car and go That's with it. us downtown. And then when we'd come back, we'd have to put Bort back. So yes, Bort was real. Bort was real. You heard it here, everybody. Fantastic. That's great. So this is, this, I'm going to ask one more question, and this is really about transition. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because you've, even since leaving your presidencies, you've made other transitions into other, you know, board appointments and other, other roles, et, et cetera. So the question is how, how to transition roles, say from profit to nonprofit or academia to business with confidence so that your skills will transfer. And I know there are a few stories in the book about this as well. So maybe talk about transitions. In your, your yeah. So I th it, first of all, transitions are difficult. Uh, all transitions involve loss. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to be able to process that loss. But I think the, and in the book we, we talk quite a lot about, you know, how you select what you want to do with your time because it's very, precious time, particularly if you've been in an extremely busy job. And, you know, it, it also links into aging, you know, so I'll combine the two. It's about how do you take care of mind, body, and spirit, right, when you are no longer leading and you're going into a transition role. And, you know, it, I talk, we talk about relationships, the importance of relationships, the importance of finding something that really stimulates your mind. Uh, so don't just randomly decide you're going to join this board or do that nonprofit thing or take on this job. Absolutely be sure that it provides you the stimulation that is rewarding. And then take care of yourself uh, emotionally uh, and, and create a sense of joy in the years that you have after you leave a, a leadership position. Yeah, I love that. Focus on joy, obviously. Joy. <laughs> hey, focus there on joy. Yeah. yeah, just yeah. It. You don't any, you don't need any lessons on that. <laughs> well, I would just say that for me, the transition, a, a different kind of a different approach uh, right. in terms of having to do something different right. than what you have been doing is very difficult. And uh, for me, it was a very difficult task to become a corporate board director. As I've said before, I think women sometimes have their emphasis on the wrong thing. They want to get on the boards, but once you're on, you got to perform, and it's tough. And so I thought my default position for any of these things is learning. 
So when I feel over my head, and I felt over my head a lot going from what I had been doing to corporate boards, I took all sorts of courses you know, to try to help me and got mentors and had people help me, which is the way that, and it take, it's, it's an effort and it's, it's hard work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's humbling, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. very humbling. <laughs> very humbling. Am I getting a cue that there's a question in the audience? <laughs> There's a question in the audience, so please go ahead. This is incredible, and I want to thank you for answering my question. But the next one up, I really want to know the answer to, and it's about asking for a raise. And I wonder oh. if you could do one more. Asking do one more, okay, one more. How do you ask for ask a raise? Ask for a raise. Well, I think you make it very clear. You know, first of all, I'm taking notes. No. You, you, you have you have you you have performance criteria, and if you've done a good job and your boss has said, you've done a good job. Uh, a couple of things. First of all, you ask the question, you know, is my performance above average, below average, or average? And if you say I've done all these wonderful things, and if I'm above average, then I need to be paid above average. So what is the average for this particular uh, job? And, and I think it's about being clear, about being forthright, and about being uh, acknowledging that, you know, you believe in being performance driven, You've done your best job. You've met the goals. Time for a raise. Any other advice? No, I think, uh, you know, I was terrible at it. So I <laughs> don't ask me for advice on it. But I think the trick is to have the performance objective set out. Yes. If you try to go in without those. Look, I don't have a chance. And you just say, look, I did a wonderful job. But nobody had set out for you what you agreed to do. It's, it's tough. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're going to demand anything before you demand a raise, demand that they set out what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And if you can, what do I have to do to get a raise? Mm -hmm. And if you have that down and you can show that you've done it, then, you know, it's a fait accompli. Well, I hope that helped. I hope you feel empowered. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. Thanks for the question. I am conscious of the fact that our time is coming to an end. I'm getting this. This means something, right? I know that, exactly. So um, first of all, my word, you two are amazing. So thank you ever so much for this conversation. Please join me in thanking these two amazing thank you. Thank you. My, my work is not complete. I, I also want to thank SFU Public Square yeah. for their outstanding yeah. event organization. The volunteers, Max, SFU Woodward's tech team for live streaming the event. Thank you. Yeah. The back thank of the you. room, thank you ever so much. Thank you to AI Media once again. And thanks to all of you online in the room for being here. Um, it's really been incredible. There are books for sale at the back of the room. I encourage people to buy this amazing book and you, you might be able to get one of these two to sign it for you as well. Um, and uh, you know, I just, um, it's really been an, an incredible evening. I know we didn't get to all the questions, but there's a lot of love here, I've got to tell you. So thank you ever so much. It's been a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.